So the first thing that we're going to talk about today is the inverse Laplace transform um, when our frequency domain function has a combination of distinct and repeated real poles. So, as an example, um, let's say that we have a generic function f of s that could be split into the product of two functions, f1 of s times f2 of s, where f1 of s is some polynomial in our numerator divided by s plus some first pole times s plus some discrete second pole and so on and so forth all the way out to s plus p sub n and then f2 is something like 1 over s plus some pole to the mth power, where none of these p with a subscript or this p without a subscript are equal to each other, right? So I need, I have my repeated poles taken care of over here with this guy, and I have my distinct real poles taken care of this function f1 of t. So for, who is that? Yes. Okay. Sorry. I didn't look familiar. And so I was like, there's a random person sitting in my classroom who's about to get really mad about the math that I'm going to do. Okay. I apologize for how bored you're going to be. All right. So. <laughs> we could split this thing up um, using the partial fraction expansion techniques that we have learned up to this point into something that would look like this. So we would have A1 over S plus P1 plus A2 over S plus P2 all the way out to A sub N over S plus P sub N. And then in addition to that, so that's what our partial fraction expansion of our distinct real pole section would look like. Then we would also have um, B1 over S plus P plus B2 over S plus P squared all the way out to B sub M over S plus P to the mth power. So we would just apply the techniques that we talked about on Wednesday for the distinct real poles part, and we would also apply the techniques we learned later on on Wednesday for our repeated real poles part. So just as a relatively straightforward example, let's say that we have the following S domain function, F of S is equal to two S squared plus four S minus 10 over S plus six multiplied by S plus two quantity squared. So just as our sanity check, we should always be doing this. Um, the order of my numerator polynomial is two. The order of my denominator polynomial is three because I'm gonna have an S times an S cubed. So since the order of the denominator is less than the order of the numerator, we're good to go with these techniques. All right, so this should have a partial fraction decomposition of A1 over S plus 6 plus B1 over S plus 2 plus B2 
over s plus 2 quantity squared. So do you guys remember how to calculate that first factor a1? So we multiply this whole thing by a factor of s plus 6, and then we would evaluate that expression at s is equal to negative 6, right? So we would have s plus 6 times whatever f of s is evaluated at s is equal to minus 6. Just to save some time here, um, the s plus 6 that we're multiplying by is going to eliminate this s plus 6 or cancel out that s plus 6 in the denominator. So we should just have 2 times negative 6 squared plus 4 times negative 6 minus 10 over a factor of negative 6 plus 2 quantity squared. Um, and so this comes out to be, if my math is correct, and I believe it is, 19 over 8. So we only have that one distinct real pole, so we don't have to do anything else with that particular formula. <laughs> so now let's move along to our repeated real poles. So I tend to solve for the highest order term first. So can you guys remember how we do that? So we're gonna have S plus two quantity squared multiplied by F of S, and we're gonna evaluate at S is equal to negative two. So that is effectively just going to get rid of this guy right here. And then everything that I don't have covered up, we're just going to substitute in negative 2 for S. So I believe that should give me 2 times negative 2 quantity squared plus 4 times negative 2 minus 10 all over negative 2 plus six, and that should come out to negative five halves, if my math is correct, which once again, I believe it is. How do we find B1? So we're going to multiply through by S plus 2, right? Actually, no, we're going to multiply through by S plus 2 squared. And then we're going to take the derivative of whatever's remaining and evaluate that at S minus 2. So this is the derivative with respect to S of S plus 2 squared times f of s, and then we evaluate that at s is equal to minus 2. So we're going to be taking the derivative with respect to s of 2s squared plus 4s minus 10 all over s plus 6, and then we evaluate this at s is equal to minus 2. So how are we going to take the derivative of this thing? quotient rule, right? Because we've got a function of s in the numerator and a function of s in the denominator. So just to remind you guys and also myself of how the quotient rule works, I believe um, the derivative with respect to some made up variable x of f of x over g of x should be the derivative of g times
times f minus the derivative of f times g, sorry, I'm running out of room there, over g squared. Does that look roughly right? So, I'm going to just bring this down here. What's the derivative of my denominator with respect to s? One. Is it? This is what happens when I have to do calculus from memory. So, so second derivative of a half. Okay. All right. Um, so then we'll have s plus six. Sorry. Really? If I had screwed up the order there, the only thing that would have happened is our answer would have been negative of what we should have gotten. So it wouldn't have been that big of a deal if I had continued to screw it up. But anyway, um, so S plus six. So what's the derivative of the numerator? 4S plus four. Um, minus that 2S squared plus 4S minus 10. And then here's that one from taking the derivative of the denominator. And this is all divided by the denominator squared. And then this thing gets evaluated at s is equal to minus 2. And that's going to come out to be negative 3 eighths. So from that, we have f of s is equal to 19 eighths over s plus six minus three eighths over s plus two minus five halves over s plus two quantity squared. And from that, our time domain function should be what? Toby. Forgive me if I'm missing or something, but was there some formula with these where you had to divide by a factorial? Yes, but since we're only doing the first derivative, we're dividing by one factorial, so it didn't matter. But if we had doing the second derivative, we would have divided by two factorial, third derivative, three factorial, and so on and so forth. So you're absolutely correct, but it doesn't matter here. So what's the inverse Laplace transform of this guy right here, right? One over 19 times the inverse Laplace transform of one over S plus six. What's the inverse Laplace transform of one over s plus six? E to the negative six t u of t, right? So this will be nineteen over eight e to the minus six t, and then way out here at the end, I'll put in my u of t because all of these are going to involve the unit step function. All right, what's my inverse Laplace transform of this middle thing? So three eighths e to the negative two t, right? Easy enough. And the inverse Laplace transform of our last bit here, where we've got that s plus two quantity squared. Five halves. Five halves t e to the negative two t. Absolutely right. And I'm just going to scooch this guy over. There we go. Great job. All right, so now let's make things horrifying and deal with complex numbers. Yay. Yes. Hey, I don't care what you use as long as you get the right answer. Yep. Uh, 
All right, so let's talk about distinct complex wholes. All right, so let's say that I have a function f of s is equal to 4s plus 1 over s squared plus 4s plus 13. So when we had a term similar to this yesterday, when we first started talking about the inverse Laplace transform, um, I effectively just broke this thing down into such a way where I would have a repeated real whole plus some term, right? So I could make this look like 4s plus 1 over s squared plus 4s plus 4 plus an additional factor of 9 or 4s plus 1 over s plus 2 quantity squared plus 3 quantity squared. Okay. So let's start with, do we have anything that would work for this? So, so if I'm remembering correctly, and I didn't bring those notes, I feel like we do have something if we had, like, something with S plus 2 up here. And then the s plus 2 squared down here and the 3 here. And we also have something where we just have a constant number on the top, right? That, if I'm remembering correctly, would be my cosine with a phase angle and my sine with a phase angle inverse Laplace transform. Or am I misremembering that? Do you have one that's like s plus a over? Or no, it's the, it's the exponentially decaying. Sinusoid. Okay, so let's let's keep on trucking here. So we can mess around with this, right? So if I wanted to take a factor of s plus two out of this thing, I could add and subtract seven. There's nothing wrong with that. So plus seven and minus seven, and what that would give me would be four times s plus two over s plus 2 quantity squared plus 3 squared minus 7 over s plus 2 quantity squared plus 3 squared, right? Four times s plus 1 plus 7 is four times s plus 8 when I take out the s plus 2 that is just four times S plus two, right? And then I have to take that minus seven out because it just can't come out of totally nowhere. So that's where this minus seven came from over here. And so I have a Laplace transform for this thing, right? So if I'm also remembering correctly, and it helps that I have my notes in front of me, um, for the exponentially decaying sine function, I should have this guy in the numerator, if I'm remembering correctly, right? So if I want a three here, I need to multiply this by, guy by a factor of seven thirds here for that to cancel out. So we would have four times S plus two 
over s plus two quantity squared plus three quantity squared minus seven thirds of three over s plus two quantity squared plus three quantity squared like so. And now I have things exactly in a form that I'm used to. Okay. So f of t could be written as 4e to the minus 2t cosine of 3t u of t minus 7 thirds e to the minus 2t sine 3t u of t like so. So that's technically correct, but it did involve a lot of interesting steps, to say the least, to get to that point. Okay? So let's see if we can think about things in a slightly different way, right? This is just a second order polynomial, which means I can always just use good old fashioned um, quadratic equation to figure out what the roots of that thing is and figure out what my poles are, right? So s squared plus 4s plus 13, applying the quadratic equation, so I would have um, the s values that make that blow up, so my poles, s1 and 2, would be negative 4 plus or minus the square root of 4 squared, so let's just put 16 minus Four AC, right? So four times thirteen would be fifty-two. If I'm remembering correctly. All over two A, so that would just be two times one, and so this should be <laughs> negative two plus or minus. Hey, can we hold on just a second? <laughs> B squared is 16, or AC. Let me get my calculator here. Let me lay you. So I'm starting with 4s plus 13, or s squared plus 4s plus 13. So negative, <laughs> okay, just um, square root of 16 minus 52, that's the bit that's getting me. So 52 minus 16, okay. So that would be 36. The square root of 36 is 6. Divide that by 2 does give me the 3. Okay, now that is that is right. I just, the, the square root of 16 minus 52 bit coming out to 3 was what was bothering me, but I forgot that I was supposed to divide that result by 2. Okay, so we have distinct complex holes, right? So we should be able to express f of s using partial fraction expansion as some coefficient over s plus our first pole. And I'm going to call this coefficient b1, and I'm going to put a bar over it because it's going to wind up being a complex number, plus some coefficient b2 over s plus our second pole. So what I'm going to do is my poles are just the negative of this thing, right? So I should have s plus 2 plus j3. And 
and then plus two minus J3. So let's look back at what we've done previously, just so I can make sure we're all on the same page here, right? So when I had S plus six, a value of negative six is what makes this thing blow up, right? So we evaluated this at S is equal to negative six. So we were flipping the sign on this thing. So I have this S value. I'm flipping the sign to give me the thing that goes in here. Is that okay? All right. Showing the sign we have to Exactly right. So when we had the S plus two here, we were evaluating at our pole value of S is equal to minus two because the value of minus two is what makes this thing blow up to infinity. So we're starting with this value and we're trying to reconstruct the things that go in our denominator. So I just flip the sign. Yes, so we had a negative two at the beginning, which is why I have a positive two here. And then I'm saying the minus two minus J3 is my first fold. So I just got rid of both of those negative signs. And then minus two plus J3 was my second fold. So I just swapped the signs on both terms. So now let's see what happens if we use our method for distinct real poles, okay? So we're just trying to see what shakes out, okay? So B1 would be S plus two minus J3 times F of S, and we would evaluate at S is equal to Sorry, that should be a plus sign. My bad. Uh, negative two minus J3. So I'm going to go through the motions here really quickly. So we would have a factor of S plus two plus J3 times our original numerator of four S plus one over S plus two plus J3 times S plus two minus J3, where that's just that S squared plus four S plus 13 thing that we had originally. Four S. Yeah, S squared plus four S plus 13, just factored. <clears throat> so what we will, oh, and we, sorry, let me cancel this guy out and cancel this guy out. And we're going to evaluate this thing at S is equal to minus two minus J3. And in doing so, and you're free to put this in your calculator if you care to, we wind up getting 2.315 with an angle of negative 30.315. 256 degrees in polar form. Throw this into your calculator and make sure I'm not completely losing my damn mind here, please. So if I were doing this, I would store this thing as just some variable x and then put in 4x plus 1 over x plus 2 minus j3 and then have the answer spit out or have the calculator spit out the answer in polar form. So minus two, minus three, I shit. store that as A. And then I have four A plus one divided by A 
plus two minus three I. 2.315 with an angle of negative 30.256 and some change. All right, so this seems okay. Solving for B2, that's going to be S plus 2 minus J3 times F of S evaluated at S is equal to negative 2 plus J3. So just to go through the motions here really quickly, we would have S plus 2 minus J3 times 4S plus 1 over s plus 2 plus j3 times s plus 2 minus j3. Evaluate this at s is equal to negative 2 plus j3. And this guy and this guy cancel each other out. And when I did this last year, I got 2.315 with an angle of positive 30.256 degrees. How are these results related to each other? They are complex conjugates of each other. That will always be true. So realistically, if you calculate one of the coefficients, you automatically know the other one because it will always be the complex conjugate. Okay? So let's see what shakes out of that. Okay. So what we should wind up getting for f of s is, so I should have b1, so that is 2.315. I'm going to shift things very slightly here. So instead of putting it in polar form, I'm going to choose to represent this number in exponential form because the polar form and the exponential form of a complex number literally contain the same information, right? So I'll have just magnitude e to the j theta. So 2.315 e to the negative j 30.256 degrees over s plus 2 plus j3 plus B2, which I'm going to represent as 2.315 E to the positive J, 30.256 degrees over S plus 2 minus J3. And I know this is going to sound insane, but I can just take the inverse Laplace transform of this. Okay. So F of T should be 2.315 E to the minus J 30.256 degrees times E to the negative 2 minus J3 T plus 2.31. Sorry, this one should be a plus sign. Yes, that one should be a plus sign. Sorry about that. 2.315 E to the positive J, 30.256 degrees. E to the minus 2 minus J3 T close that U of T. So let me just double check here to make sure that I've done things correctly, right? So whenever we have ignore these numerators whenever I have 1 over S plus A my inverse Laplace transform is just e to the negative at, right? So a in this case, for this guy, is just 2 plus j3, so I put a 2 plus j3 here. 
Same thing here. Now my A is two minus J3, so I put two minus J3 here. And then I'm just treating my numerator as if it were any regular old number. So we have this thing. This is technically correct, but you're probably thinking, what the shit is going on? Why do I have complex numbers in the time domain? Because that should literally never happen. So let's play around with this and see if we can't make this look like something a little less terrifying. So I can split this exponential up into e to the minus 2t times e to the minus j3t. And I can do something similar over here. Okay. So we would have 2.315 e to the minus j 30.256 degrees times e to the minus 2t times e to the minus j3t plus 2.315 e to the j 30.256 degrees times e to the minus 2t times e to the plus j3t u of t. Are we all with me so far? Anybody got any questions, comments, or concerns? I just expanded them out. And so what I'm going to do in this next step, I've got an e to the j thing here and an e to the j thing here, so I'm going to lump these two guys together. Okay, so the ones with the j's I'm going to lump together, and the ones without the j's, I'm just going to leave them on the outside of things. Okay. Actually, I could go one step further, if I were so inclined, I could go ahead and pull out this factor, common factor 2.315 as well. So I'm going to pull out a 2.315 e to the negative 2t from both terms there. So 2.315 e to the negative 2t multiplied by um, so let's see, we've got an e to the j 3t plus 30.256 degrees. So that's from my second term. Plus e to the minus j 3t plus 30.256 six degrees for my first term. All of this is multiplied by U of T. Are we okay with this? So just to be super clear here, this negative sign, or I'm pulling this negative J out and this negative J, which is giving me the three T plus 30.256 over here. So I did not miss a negative sign. So let me ask you guys a question. We did this a couple of days ago, so it's perfectly reasonable if you don't remember. Um, but if I had e to the jx plus e to the negative jx, and then I multiply this thing by a factor of one half, what is that the same as? So just because I'm hearing a lot of different things, let's sort this out real quick, right? So we know that Euler's identity says that e to the jx is equal to cosine of x plus j sine x, and e to the minus jx would be cosine of negative x. Cosine of negative x is the same thing as cosine of x, right? And then we would have plus j sine of negative x, or the sine of negative x is the same thing as negative sine of x. 
So I'm going to do minus j sine of x. When I add these two things together, I get e to the jx plus e to the minus jx is equal to twice cosine of x. What do I have up here? X is just 3t plus 30.256 degrees. So this comes out to be 2.315 e to the negative 2t times the cosine, actually twice the cosine. So I need to double that 3.215. Um, so let me just go ahead and take care of that. So that would come out to be 4.631 without rounding error. E to the minus 2t cosine of 3t plus 30.256 degrees u of 2. So from this example, we can actually come up with an identity, okay? So I got something of the form E to the minus a t cosine omega t plus some phase angle from a frequency domain function of the form one half. Let me make sure I get these signs right here really quickly. So I had. positive phase angle on the s plus a minus j omega thing. Okay, so e to the j theta over s plus a minus j omega plus e to the negative j theta over s plus a plus j omega. So effectively, if I have a polynomial in my denominator that has complex conjugate poles, <laughs> as long as I can find out what the phase angle of one of those poles is, and the magnitude, I would simply multiply the magnitude by a factor of two, and then throw my phase angle here. And then the real part of my pole tells me what A is, and the imaginary part of my pole tells me what omega is. So I should never have to do that again. So this business right here should be, well, actually, if we just looked at the, the numerator part, this business right here would be twice cosine. Since I have a single cosine on this side, I have to divide both this side by a half. And it's from those identities that we just did a moment ago where we proved that e to the jx plus e to the negative jx is equal to twice cosine. All right, so the last one that I want to look at and the last one that we need to look at is what happens if we have repeated complex poles. Here. 
All right, so <clears throat> if we have a situation where we have repeated complex poles, um, what we're going to do is kind of throw the method for repeated real poles at it and then come up with a similar ugly looking relationship. Okay. And then see what we can simplify that down towards. So let's say that we have some function f of s, 108 s squared plus 2 over s squared plus 10s plus 34 quantity squared. So using the quadratic function, um, I should be able to get this expressed as 108 times s squared plus 2 divided by s plus 5 plus j3 quantity squared times s plus 5 minus j3 quantity squared. So we've got complex conjugate poles and they are repeated. So what we should expect is something of the form as follows, right? So some coefficient b1 Stylus, why are you being a dick? Just a Save that, close this. Reopen. All right, let's see which one of these three is going to write worth a shit. Because apparently my new one is being a douche again. There we go. All right, that one doesn't look horrifying. I, no, I don't want one note open. What are you doing? All right, let me just use this. All right, so we should have B1 over S plus 5 plus J3 plus B1 conjugate over S plus 5 minus J3 plus B2 over S plus 5 plus J3 quantity squared plus B2 conjugate over 
S plus five minus J three quantity squared. So let's solve for B2 first. So we should only have to solve for like B1 and B2. Exactly right. So if we get B1 and we get B2, then we can just use the conjugates in the other places. We don't need to even bother with it. 100% correct. That is probably the only good thing that comes out of having repeated poles is we know what our, our complex poles is. We know what the other one is going to be. So to determine B2, we are going to multiply our original function by S plus 5 plus J3 quantity squared times F of S, and then evaluate this at S is equal to minus five minus J3. And in doing so, what I wound up getting was 104.957 with an angle of negative 120.964 degrees. From that, B2 conjugate is just 104.957 with an angle of positive 120.964 degrees. So that one's fairly straightforward. For B1, I'll go into a little bit more detail because this is going to be the one that involves actually taking a derivative. So it's a little bit harder to just check our math directly, right? So because it's only a first derivative, we're multiplying this by a factor of one over one factorial, which is just one. Thank you for pointing that out again, Toby. You were 100% correct. So we're going to take the derivative with respect to S of S plus, that S looks too much like a five to me. Hold on. S plus 5 plus J3 squared times F of S. And then evaluate this at S is equal to B1 plus J squared? Yes, it should always be squared. And then we take the derivative. S minus 5 minus J3. So let's expand this out so we can see what's happening, right? Um, so this is going to be the derivative with respect to S of, so in my numerator, I should have S plus 5 plus J3 quantity squared times 108 times S squared plus two. In my denominator, I'll have S plus five plus J three squared times S plus five minus J three squared. Close that, evaluate it at S is equal to minus five minus J three. So this guy right here cancels this guy right here. And so we once again got ourselves a quotient rule situation. Okay. So it's the denominator times the derivative of the numerator, right? So I'm just going to pull that factor of 108 out. So my denominator is S plus 5 minus J3 squared. The derivative of my numerator is just 2S. Then I take the derivative of my 
denominator, which is just going to be two times that thing. Oh, and that should be a minus sign. My apologies. S plus five minus J three times my numerator, which is S squared plus two. And then all of this over S plus five minus J three to the fourth power. This is evaluated at S is equal to minus five minus J three. And so this comes out to be 36 with an angle of negative 90 degrees. Actually, I think it comes out to be 36 with an angle of positive 90. In the grand scheme of things, it won't matter. From this, B1 conjugate is then 36 angle negative 90 degrees. And so all right, my good stylus is working again, so I don't have to use this shitty pen. Awesome. I can tell my handwriting was getting really shitty, and I don't like it that it's less good than usual. All right, so f of s would have been 36 angle 90 degrees over s plus 5 plus j3 plus 36 angle negative 90 degrees over s plus 5 minus j3 plus up here yep 104.957 with an angle of negative 120.964 degrees over S plus 5 plus J3 quantity squared plus 104.957 with an angle of positive 120.964 degrees all over S plus 5 minus J3 squared, which would have an inverse Laplace transform of so if we ignore this crap over here to the right, this is just what we did a moment ago. Right? So we should double our magnitude, 72. A is 5, so we'll have e to the minus 5t. Um, Omega is three, so this will look like cosine of three t, and then let me double check what the sign on this thing is supposed to be. So plus theta, where notice that theta is the angle that's corresponding to when we were looking at a minus. J omega. So effectively, we should just flip the sign on, B, uh, flip the sign on the angle of B one. So minus ninety degrees, okay. and then added to that, we will have two 
some other stuff. Well, let me see what the hell I did here. Okay, so when I have one over S plus A quantity squared, what's the inverse Laplace transform of that? T e to the minus a t, right? So in this case, a is five plus j three. So that's going to look like one o four point nine five seven e to the negative j. 120.964 degrees T E to the minus five plus J three T. And because I'm running out of room, I'll tuck this one down here. 104.957 E to the J positive. 120.964 degrees T E to the minus five minus J three T close this thing U of T. And then I can just do effectively the same kind of trickery as I did before, right? So I can see very easily that I have a common factor of 104.957t e to the minus 5t that I can take out. And that leaves me with an e to the j 3t plus 120.964 and an e to the minus j 3t plus 120.964 like we did in the last example problem, right? So this is going to wind up giving me yeah. 72e to the minus 5t cosine 3t minus 90 degrees plus twice 104.957, so that comes out to be 209.914 t e to the minus 5t cosine 3t plus 120.964 degrees u of t. So what we just stumbled into is effectively, if I have a Laplace transform of the form 1 over S e to the j theta over S plus A minus j omega to the nth power plus e to the minus j theta over s plus a plus j omega to the nth power. The inverse Laplace transform is t to the n minus 1 over n minus 1 factorial e to the negative a t cosine omega t plus theta u of t, where we really only proved it when n was equal to 2. But by the looks of this thing, you don't want me to try to prove it for n any larger than 2. OK, so I apologize for this being a math class for the last two weeks. Come Monday. We're going to figure out how any and all of this crap relates to circuit theory. Okay, so finally, no longer a math class. You are in significant luck that the circuit theory part of this is way easier. So I, I want to be really clear about what I am expecting of you guys at this point. So we have gone through and we have figured out how to 
take the Laplace transform of practically any time domain function that we could be interested in, and we've created a table um, that allows us to go back and forth between the time domain and the frequency domain for any function that we might see. So I don't expect you guys to ever have to derive any of this shit. Use your tables. For the homeworks, all of that kind of stuff. Use the tables. For your exam, and I will actually probably upload this later today just in case you took shitty notes or I missed a sign or something like that, I will actually provide you with a fully filled out table to begin with so that you don't have to rely on yours. So we went through all of this to show the mechanics of how it works because I do think that that is important. Use the table. Hopefully I've showed you that this is gross enough to where you don't want to do it every single time. All right. You guys have a good weekend. I will see you on Monday for less terrifying things, I hope.